So here we are on our final Sunday of our generosity series, and we have determined that this series is really about what it means to be a disciple. It's less about money and more about discipleship, and we've determined that our definition of discipleship is that we become so much like Jesus, we follow Jesus, we are so much a student of Christ that it is hard to tell the difference between us and God. We've determined that when we are striving to be disciples of Jesus Christ, one of the automatic outputs of that is generosity. When we live as disciples of Jesus Christ, we have no need because generosity takes care of it all. So as we enter into our time around generosity grounded by God today, please turn with me in your Bibles, iPads, bulletins, uh, any way you want to get to it, your mobile phone to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. I will be reading from the New International Version from Matthew, chapter 22, Verses 34 through 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, draw us nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Lord, take this your servant Jasmine and hide her behind that old rugged cross so that everything that is heard, everything that is said, everything that is done comes straight from you, O oh God. For we have not come this morning to hear a word from Jasmine. But we have come expecting to hear you speak to our hearts and our minds and our souls. So gracious and loving God, allow your word to speak. Pour it down like rain. Open our eyes to see your majesty. To be still and know that you are in this place. Please let us stay and rest in your holiness. This is your servant's prayer in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen. I saw something really ridiculous earlier this week, y'all. I went to the grocery store, and those of you all who know me well know that I don't do that very often. But I went to the grocery store, and I was trying to get into a parking space, and I saw these people in the parking space literally fighting over a shopping cart. Now that's ridiculous because if one of them had just taken about 15 steps, there were plenty of shopping carts available. But both of them had decided that that shopping cart was theirs. That that shopping cart belonged to them. That that shopping cart was theirs and nobody else could have it. And as ridiculous as that sounds to us, don't we act that way sometimes? You don't have to say amen, you can say ouch. Sometimes we have decided that something that we have gotten or something that we want is ours and nobody else can have it. We have 
decided that the Legos that my godchildren love, that Alexa, Alexa has decided that the pink ones are hers and the blue ones are Miles, her little brother. And that there is no crossover, even though they're exactly the same. But like children, we fuss and fight over our parking spaces, our lane on the road, our lawn, our stuff. And because I worked hard for it, because I bought it, because I did it, it belongs to me and to me alone. I wonder what would happen in our lives if God was like that. I wonder what would happen if God said, yeah, I don't feel like blowing breath into you today. I'm tired. I wonder what would happen if God said, oh, you think that car is yours or you think that house is yours or you think this earth is yours or you think that child is yours or you think that job is yours. Oh, I don't want to give it to you today. What if God said, I don't want to share this earth. I don't want to share these people. I don't want to be generous. It's hard to hold the mirror up to ourselves that way, isn't it? Nobody wants to be labeled as selfish. Nobody wants to be labeled as stingy. Nobody wants to be labeled as holding back from God because, I mean, in this place, we're all generous church folks, right? But generosity is a call to self-examination. Generosity is a call to pull back the, the, the film and the things that block us from seeing what is in us that is not of God. Generosity isn't just about money. Generosity is about spirit, it is about soul, it is about love. Generosity is about how we treat our neighbor. Generosity is about how we walk and how we talk. Generosity is even about how we drive, Pastor Jasmine. Some of y'all are gonna get that tomorrow. <laughs> So we come to the gospel lesson this morning with a different kind of lens around the greatest commandment, right? Most of the time when we talk about the greatest commandment, we talk about how mean the temple leaders were to Jesus, and we talk about what it means to be kind to our neighbors, but we never really want to talk about what kindness really means. You see... Jesus was teaching, and by this point in Matthew, Jesus is making his way to the cross. Jesus is making his way to Calvary. Jesus is making his way to share with us the ultimate sacrifice. And the teachers in the temple, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they're trying Jesus. They're asking him and pushing on him because he's, he is messing up the status quo. He's messing with their money. He's messing with their status. He's messing with their pew. He's messing with their leadership position. He's messing with everything that they know to be true. He's challenging them, pushing back on them, and saying there's more to life than just dotting the I's and crossing the T's. You have to actually believe and live this stuff. So in the Gospel of Matthew, just when Jesus finishes setting the Sadducees straight about resurrection, then the Pharisees jump on board. And the Pharisees get together to gang up on Jesus and they said, all right, since you have all the answers, <laughs> teacher, 
That would have been a sarcastic call to Jesus. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? I'm sure Jesus laughed. See, my Jesus is sarcastic, y'all. So uh, I'm sure Jesus laughed a little bit, and Jesus laughed and said, don't you know the answer to that? You know the Torah back and front. You know that in Deuteronomy, God has already given you the answer to this. You know that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God. But when you love the Lord your God, don't love the Lord your God in a Pharisaic, really slim, really harsh, really boxed in kind of way. But love the Lord your God in the gray areas when you don't understand when the answer is not clear, when you have a hard time, when life is hard, when you are angry, when you are afraid, when you are hungry, when you are broke, when you cannot see the forest for the trees. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. If we love the Lord our God with all your heart and all our souls and all our minds, then that means that we love God with everything that we have and everything that we are. C.S. Lewis, I think, put it best. He said, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. So to love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind is to love God with every fiber of our being. It means to walk lockstep with God. It means that we think and we talk and we live and we give and we love and we're in relationship with each other the very same way that God is in relationship with us. And then Jesus said, the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. The news of the week, <laughs> social media posts, unneighborly exchanges in my neighborhood <laughs> prove that we're not really sure what that commandment means. And quite frankly, some of us are so bad to ourselves that I don't want you to love me like you love yourself. You can say amen. But the importance of this is that everything, everything hangs on these commands. We cannot be generous. We cannot be disciples of Jesus Christ. We cannot be grounded in our faith and in God if we cannot love the Lord our God with everything that we have and if we cannot love our neighbors like we love ourselves. Well, what does this mean for me, Reverend? Well, let me give you some help. The definition of generosity that Merriam-Webster gives us says that generosity is the quality, the quality of being kind, understanding, and not selfish. That generosity is a willingness a willingness to give in abundance. It's a readiness and a breath that defies definition. It is freedom from small, meaningless mindsets. 
What does it mean to be free from small and meaningless mindsets? It means to be free from a mindset of scarcity. It means to be free from a mindset of victimhood. It means to be free from a mindset that God has forgotten us. It means to be free from anger. It means to be free that somebody owes us something. It means to be free from everything that keeps us bound and separates us from God. Generosity means freedom. God helps us out by setting the example for us. In Genesis chapter 1, you'll remember that it says in the beginning, God In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created man in his own image, in the image of God. God created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them. And God saw all that he had made and it was very good. That means that our nature is to be generous. So when we are not living a life of generosity, we are living outside of what it means to be like God. We're living outside of our very nature. That's why we're sick and tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired because we're living outside of who God created us to be in the first place. Then in Romans 8, 32, in John 3, 16, God said, For God so loved the world that he gave. And he didn't give what his leftovers. He didn't give what he was comfortable giving. God didn't give the scraps off the table. God gave the very best that he had to give. He gave his one and only son so that. You and I might live and have eternal life. And in Romans 8, 32, it says that he, God did not give up his own son. God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us. So how will he not also along with him gradually, graciously give us all things? Now, if God is willing to give us anything, if our nature is generosity, then why? Why are we discouraged? Why are we afraid? Why are we living in the scraps of life? instead of the abundance of life. God promised you more than that. He gave you more than that. So when will we walk in the promises of God? When will we stand up and say that I know, that I know, that I know that there is more to life than scarcity. There is more to life than selfishness. There is more to life than being afraid. There is more to life than counting what I don't have. There is more to life than being mean. There is more to life than being... mm. But pastor, it's hard. I worked really hard to get here this morning. I worked really hard to make it from Sunday to Sunday. I worked really hard to get here in my life. And generosity has been a struggle for me. So how do I change now? You remember our friend Nehemiah? Nehemiah puts it this way. In Nehemiah 6, 
verse 9, he says, they were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So I continued the work with even greater determination. Are you determined to be generous? Are you determined to live a life that is grounded in God's generosity? Are you determined to live not knowing what the next step is, but knowing that whatever it is, that God has it and that God has given it to you and that God is making a way out of no way? Are you ready to live a generous life? And if you are, how will you reflect this life? How will you live in such a way that the people who are looking for Jesus will be able to say, I see him in you. I see him in you because of your generous life. Friends, God gave everything everything for us. God gave everything for us. God gave everything so that we can sit in this place today. God gave everything so that we might live and not just so that we might live, but so that we might live in an abundance of life. Now, don't get it twisted. This is not a prosperity gospel. Abundance doesn't mean that we are rolling in the dough, as the young folks say. But what it does mean is that we are people of hope. People who have the kind of future that is bright and large and bigger than anything we expect or imagine. It means that we don't have to worry. We don't have to fret. Because our God has everything that we need. It means that you can share with your sister. Because <laughs> there's more where that came from. I have a question for you today. Are you ready to live generously? Do you know that you were created for a generous life? Are you ready to make some changes? To live in this abundance? There are no buts and no what ifs in the greatest commandments. There's nothing that says love your neighbor as yourself unless they're mean to you. There's nothing that says love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul unless you don't feel like it today. Stop letting the world intimidate you into being something that you are not. You're created in God's generous image. take out those cards in your bulletins or the cards that you brought with you today and I want you to write how you're going to change your behavior how you're going to grow so that you can live this generous life what needs to change so that you become the person who lives generously so that you become a person who lives in your nature so that you become a person who is striving for a more generous life. Do you need to adjust how you love? Do you need to adjust how you spend your time? Do you 
might need to adjust some of your relationships or your behavior in your relationships? Do you need to adjust how you spend your resources? I'm adjusting all of those because I promised you when I came here that I wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't ask you to do anything that I'm not willing to do. I'm making some adjustments in my own life. I'm redoing my budget to increase my giving to this congregation and other charitable institutions that I support. I'm adjusting how I spend my time so that I can more fully honor God in my devotional life. I'm adjusting some relationships in my behavior in some of the relationships that I have not been God's best self in. to live into it. So I dare you. I dare you. I dare you.